biology students. Today we're going to be talking about taxonomy. We are in our new topic, but still in theme four. This is page one. So why don't we talk about taxonomy or how to name things. This is all about classification, how we classify groups of objects, information, or organism based on similarities. We've done this throughout the year, thinking about food. We've grouped things into categories like carbohydrates. We also know that even though we have these scientific categories, there's even categories that we don't talk about. We could categorize things based on color or appearance in this picture and so forth. Um, so classification is all about grouping different objects and you're going to get plenty of practice with this in class. So this is our first vocab word, classification. The next one is this fancier term which was the name of this, notes, taxonomy. You try saying it, taxonomy. This is specifically not only grouping but actually naming the organisms, giving them some sort of name so that we in the scientific community can talk about these living things. Now we will not only talk about the fact that there are names that we hear more often in our culture like this is a daffodil but guess what the daffodil has a scientific name that's even more fancy but we must ask ourselves why have that fancy scientific name and how does it work let's keep going so to understand how we get those fancier scientific names, we first have to get a little bit of history and some background basics. And so that starts with this famous man, Carl Linnaeus, or Carolus Linnaeus, sometimes he's spelled out as. And he developed the present method of classification. This was initially mostly based on structural or physical appearances. So he would say, okay, the bald eagle is white and brown. It is bigger, things that we could really easily see an organism and this cardinal it's red and it's smaller he could talk about the shape or the size of the wings things that we could all agree upon and say now do know that he didn't pick things that were biased which would be like this one's cuter than that one because not everybody's going to agree on that they had to be very much unbiased traits physical structural appearances that everybody could agree upon nothing like cute or ugly this ends up becoming part of our really important scientific naming system, which is a two-word system. We have a fancy way of talking about this two-word system. We call it the binomial nomenclature. Try saying it with me. Binomial nomenclature. Bi meaning two, nomial meaning name, meaning system. Nomenclature meaning system. Two naming system. And so here's our example. So based on what Carl Linnaeus started, we end up grouping organisms into categories and that can give us these scientific names. They're all going to be Latin and sound kind of funny and old, like Canis lupus, that means dog of the moon or wolf as we know it. Wolf is its more common name, all right? And this word Canis, right that is a bigger category canis familiaris is the name of our house dog so we're going to talk about what these two words that make up this two naming system really are about in the next little bit here so there's some rules for this binomial nomenclature business all right and this is really important and we've actually been using it some of it throughout the years we've written papers so scientific names are either underlined or italicized so canis lupus we could write it as this underlined version or this italicized version do know that when you're handwriting it is hard to distinguish between italicized and non-italicized so you might want to go with underlining unless it's something that's typed what else are our rules for binomial nomenclature? Well, they have to be Latin, and that's for a particular reason. It's a dead language. What if we pick something like um, English, which is always changing? We get new words like Google and Muggle and all sorts of things like Instagram all the time that didn't used to exist. Well, the dead language helps us really make sure that it won't change and so that scientists will be able to forever talk about canis lupus and it'll always be meaning the same thing to everyone across the board. So whether I'm in China or America or Africa, we all have the same scientific name for something so we can talk about it internationally, which is really cool and it won't change. 
The other thing was it's a binomial nomenclature, meaning it has to have both of those two words, and the two words mean something. The first word is considered a genus. This is a new vocab word, genus. It's the first word. Notice that canis lupus, gen the genus is canis. It's capitalized. All right, here's another example. Humans are called Homo sapiens. All right, Homo, the H, is always capitalized. The second word is a species named. It's going to be lowercase. All right, so for humans, Homo sapiens, sapiens has to be lowercase. All right, let's check out another example, and this one's italicized just so you can get some more practice and see other cool examples. Ursus martimus. This means the bear of the seawater, right? And so Ursus is a big category for all types of bears. We would think brown bear and black bear would have the same genus, bigger category. And it's a bigger category, meaning that's why we have it as a bigger uppercase letter than this lowercase letter that it's a more specific, smaller category. So not just bear, it's a polar bear, right? So let's talk about this a little bit more. Linnaeus realized that he really couldn't just have two names, right? And so now we, we call these different names or groupings, and as they get bigger and bigger, not just species and bigger genus, we have even bigger categories like family and even bigger categories order until we get to kingdoms, which are like animal versus plant, and then domains, which are is it eukaryote or prokaryote, which is an even bigger category. So we, right after Linnaeus, we get seven of these categories or taxa, but by now we have eight of these different categories. You will need to know these categories in their correct order from smallest to biggest or the other way around. To help us memorize these different things, we have a memory tool. So let's write it down and we're going to use humans as an example. So make this table. So. The biggest category domain for us is eukaryote. We are eukaryotes. Why? Because we have a nucleus. So our mnemonic device to help us remember is going to be D for domain. We're going to use the word did. Our kingdom is animal kingdom. All right. Kingdom is a smaller category, right? Because we know that eukaryotes are not just animals. They're plants and fungi and protists. So this is a smaller category. Phylum, try saying phylum. All right, our phylum is actually the chordata phylum, meaning that we have backbones. That's what that means, okay? And so here we can see a sentence beginning to form to make a mnemonic device, a silly sentence to help us remember. Our next smaller category is our class. For us, we as humans, we have hair as our animals, right? We not only have backbones, but we also have hair, and we have mammary glands, meaning we breastfeed, we have make milk, right? to feed our young, to give them nutrition. So that's a smaller category within this animals with backbones. And then order is an even smaller category. Specifically, not only are we mammals, but we are a primate type of animal that has a backbone that's also considered a mammal, all right? And then our family, we are of the human style family, all right? Hamadida. All right, no, you do not need to memorize all of these. This is getting very specific and for IB biology. Genus, all right, our genus, ooh, this one should look familiar. Was this one part of our scientific name? Yes, that's our first word in our scientific name, good. And lastly, species, sapiens, even more specific. All right, so that was a lot, right? And that's why we have a mnemonic device. Each letter of the taxa or category in its order from biggest to smallest is the first letter of this sentence that's quite silly to help us remember. So please, you really circle this to help you remember. Did King Philip come over for great spaghetti? Yeah, I know it doesn't make sense, but if we remember that, we can remember these in order. And I promise you have to remember them in order for a test, quiz, SOL, or final exam. Okay, so let's get some big picture down. So what does all of this mean? Well, if I have more classification levels or taxa for two organisms that are in common, that means they're more closely related. The less levels or taxa they have in common, the more distantly they are related. So if I am not only an animal, but I'm also a mammal and a primate, that means I am more closely related or have more in common with that thing because we had all of those different categories in common. 
So for instance, you do not need to write this down, but I love this because it com oops, compares things. So this is a horse, dog, and cat. We know from like just our background that dogs and cats seem more similar, but let's see why. Well, they have all of these up through the red in common, all the way through order. All right, they're carnivores, they're mammals, they have backbones, they're animals, and they're eukaryotes. Well, the order for a horse is different. So which one is more distantly related? The horse, because it has less in common with the other two. Pretty cool, right? It's a really neat way to compare the relationships, just like how we did in natural selection and evolution. All right, notice that it's not until genus and species till we get a scientific name. Let's practice this idea one more time. All right, so look at this guy here, all right? Don't write it down, too much to write down, right? Um, and just practice by looking, right? We'll do other things in class for you to get the same idea. Which of these are more related? Which rows or columns? All right, well, let's see. These are what they actually are as common names, all right? We have eukarya, planti, these are all the same so far. Ooh, and in this column, I'm looking from biggest to smallest, in this column, suddenly they get different. All right, remember, the ones that are more closely related have what? More in common. All right, this guy automatically gets thrown out because this is not in common. All right, so the red oak is more distantly related. How far do these guys have in common? <gasps> All the way through the genus, they're the same. So that's how we'll practice this in class. How similar are different organisms and how different are they? Good job, guys.